Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We are following up with John Deary, who is the filmmaker, the director, behind this extraordinary film, Conspiracy of Silence. It's about the subject of celibacy, AIDS, and homosexuality, and in general sexuality, in the Catholic Church. And it's been going on for a long, long time. This film, based on true stories of events that have happened to real people in the Catholic Church, is been showing in the United States, it's beginning to show elsewhere in the world, and deserves critical acclaim. In fact, John just came to the United States, to New York, from London, the other day to receive an award of the National Board of Review and was recognized along with Michael Moore for Fahrenheit 9-11 and Mel Gibson's film on the Passion of Christ. They all three received these accolades, these awards. So we're very glad that John has come into our studio today to speak with us about the making of the film and to continue a very interesting conversation that we began just before. Good to have you again, yes, John. Yes, thank you very much, Mitchell. Absolutely, absolutely. This is a subject, obviously, that needs more attention, so glad that you were able to stay and uh, continue on. Um, the clip that we'll be showing is on the subject of AIDS and essentially homosexuality in the church. Um, You've done a tremendous amount of research into what has gone on in the making of this film, behind the scenes, behind the doors, in the Catholic Church. What is it you feel that people should know? Well, I mean, uh, there are several things I think that people should know. I mean, uh, f first of all, I, I, in our last interview, we, we, we talked briefly about the enforced celibacy rule w within uh, the Catholic Church, uh, how that for the first 1100 years priests could be married and for the next 900 years they can't. And there's a dilemma there at, at the heart of that uh, and there's a contradiction at the heart of that for the Catholic Church. I think when you suppress sexuality, human sexuality, it's got to find its own way out, whether that is through uh, you know, homosexual, uh, homosexuality or heterosexuality or however it's bound to find it, its own way out. Not, or aggression. Or, or indeed aggression. Corruption. Or corruption or whatever it happens to be. It, it's, it, it, it's just it's the sort of law of nature, exactly. if, if, if you like. And I think it's the same with the Catholic Church. And, and you know, what we're dealing with here are, are human beings, the human emotions, just like you and I have. You and I have the choice to be celibate or not, as, as, mm -hmm. as, as we so uh, desire. And, and I think it's very, very important that priests also have that. Because this dilemma that they have, this what I often describe as, as, as a time bomb waiting to go off within Catholicism, unless it is dealt with by the Catholic Church, it can no longer be pushed under the carpet because this thing will go off. There's no question about it. My personal belief as a practicing Catholic is this, that unless the Catholic Church deals with the issue of celibacy, it will not see out the 21st century. So, you know, there are a couple of the things that, that I think, you know, people need to understand about this. And the film, Conspiracy of Silence, you know, hopefully deals with the subject I in a humane way. It's, it's, it's a love story. It's a story about corruption. It's a story about politics. It's a story about passion. It's not just a, a debate about an intellectual or theological uh, debate about celibacy. It deals with the real human cost, the real human emotion of celibacy and incredibly I mean I, I've, there's, there's, um, there's a book written by Father uh, Donald Cousins who's, who is head of a seminary in Cleveland, Ohio, St. Mary's Seminary in Cleveland, Ohio and I'll quote, the book is called The Changing Face of the Priesthood and in the book Father Donald Cousins states that 50% of the priesthood in the US from from uh, his research, he believes to be gay. Mm. Now that is an uh, that is an incredible statistic. Now, if you think about, well, if you think about it, if 50% are gay, then the 50% that are left, let's say for argument's sake, split it down the middle, 25% will m will be uh, maybe practicing heterosexuals. So you probably have 25% of men in the priesthood who 
have decided through their own uh, for their own spiritual reasons that they want to uh, remain cel uh, celibate and uh, and and that's fine but there's you know th i would say the majority of people are not celibate and that is coming from somebody who is head of one of the the, the united states uh, largest uh, seminaries now are these priests when they are found are they in some way chastised or is it just in a sense accepted in their localities uh, that they are not celibate against well, the rules of the Vatican? Well, here's the central hypocrisy, Mitchell. What, from, certainly from my research, what appears to happen is w within the Catholic Church, men are known to be gay. And as long as it's not out in the open, a blind eye is turned. And the problem uh, happens when they are found out and certainly from the research I did and many of the stories in the film are, uh, all of the stories in fact in the film are based on on uh, 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 real stories and certainly what I what I found out was that as soon as a man is found to be gay he is dropped it depends obviously on the diocese it depends on where they are mm -hmm. but basically they are dropped from the priesthood one of the priests that I interviewed told me an incredible story a really moving story he uh, was and is gay and his partner uh, sadly uh, became HIV positive. He was a, 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 a Roman Catholic priest. As soon as the bishop found out that he was HIV positive, he was ostracized from the church. So a church that teaches love and compassion and a church that teaches, you know, let, let, show the other cheek, let's help your fellow man, don't cross over to the other side of the road when somebody is lying there in the gutter. Um, Turn Every, around, everything symbolized by Jesus Christ. Everything symbolized by Christ and everything that Christ taught us and the great work that Christ taught us. Uh, th this was going on and people were ostracized to the point where one man sadly committed suicide, which is the basis of one of the stories that I tell in Conspiracy of Silence. Mm -hmm. in, in an horrendous way, as you know, uh, that suicide was pretty graphic. Indeed. Um, so, so you've got a real you've got a real dilemma there you've got a real dilemma on, on on the one hand you've got love and compassion being taught on the other hand you've got the opposite being practiced and that central hypocrisy i think is something that i found abhorrent as as a as a practicing catholic excellent it's so interesting because whether today it's aids or in past decades or centuries it was gonorrhea or syphilis it is such a symbolic representation of how anti-human celibacy as a practice, mm. a lifelong practice is. Mm. Absolutely. How inhuman it really is. Yeah. And I think one of the great features of your film, if I may say that, is uh, that um, it really does highlight how there's this, it's a splintering mechanism because it's so against human nature and you so beautifully portray how it is through this Romance of this young man with this woman, and the love is so beautiful. And if that's not godly, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, these uh, very uh, gentle, sensitive souls who, in this case, were gay, who had um, love and partnering inside the church, and then the way the church treats that, mm -hmm. which, as you're saying, is just utterly anti love. Mm -hmm. It's just the opposite of the precepts of the Catholic Church, mm. its foundation, so to speak. Mm. So what we see is that it's really not based on that at all. Mm. What we really see, and this is also exemplified in the film, that it's really an economic and political institution. And I think that we would be blind not to have s be able to see that, that that's been the case for many, many centuries. Yeah. It's not new. Yeah. This is ancient. I mean, the idea of selling or was it a pardons? I mean, that was an interesting thing from medieval times. Yeah. I, mean, I think that also showed the peculiarities of the of the uh, Roman Catholic psyche, you mm -hmm. know, the priesthood psyche. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you sell a pardon <laughs> to yeah. heaven? You yeah. know. Yeah, it's, absolutely. But uh, what else should we know? I mean, you've done so much research. I mean, before in the earlier uh, interview, you had mentioned that there were a hundred thousand priests that left that have left the priesthood in how much time? In, in the last 25 years. Now how many priests are there altogether? I mean, what percentage is that? Well, well you see, it, it's very, very <coughs> difficult to get precise figures because the Vatican cover that up. And what I say at the end of the film, it's a statistic that comes up at the end of the film, 
and we we erred on the side of of, of uh, caution there. It's that small c conservative. The the estimate is may maybe as many as half that again, or even double that, and it's extremely difficult to get any real oh. real statistics now. If you think about that, that hemorrhaging of the priesthood is unsustainable. A an example is that it, in, in, in the diocese of Dublin in Ireland, in the year 2000, there was one young man training to be a priest in the entire diocese of Dublin. And I think oh. it was either the, the year before or the year after, there, were, there was no fresh intake into seminaries. And you have these huge, monumental, vast buildings that are beautiful, that are empty. And I tried to reflect that in the movie as well. Yes. I, I had about, you know, you for, maybe t I think I had about 10 or 12 uh, people there. And that, that is an exaggeration of what the reality is. The reality is that there might be three or four people. And one of the interesting things I found was that years ago, I mean, a generation ago, and during my, certainly, you know, during my uh, parents' era, what what you had were were priests from the United States, priests from Ireland, priests from the UK, going to Africa to ad to carry the message to administer. And paradoxically, now what we've got is we have got African priests coming over here to uh, to administer here, because the intake in the African countries into seminaries has gone up, it's whereas large. in the West, you know, United States and France, it's Europe, down. it's going down. To the point of where it's almost uh, it's almost uh, gone completely. And the other thing I would say is that there is a perfection in all of this, John. Well, there is something here. One thing. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of things that are really interesting. Uh, you know, sex not open to procreation is seen by the Vatican, and as I quote, as a, an objective disorder. Now, th this is the words of the Vatican, and the Pope has called homosexuality an intrinsic moral evil. Now what I would say to that is, if that is the case, how come so many gay men are called to God? If it's an intrinsic moral evil and a man has a vocation, there is a dilemma there at the heart of that statement. And given what uh, uh, Father Donald Cousins has said, Very that half true. the priesthood are gay, then what is being uh -oh, said here? There's a syllogism. Yes. <laughs> what, 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 yeah. what is being said here? If uh, this, then that. <laughs> and that is that is very very interesting. And very much so. w w w One of my advisors on the film. I had two advisors. I had one anonymous advisor, who was quite high up. In fact, very high up in the Catholic Church, who had looked at the script. And I had two private meetings with him, and he made suggestions. And he, he said he couldn't put his head above the parapet for obvious reasons, political reasons, of course. Um, but, but he gave me some very good insights into the script. But one of the advisors who, if you like, could put his head above the parapet was a man called Mark Dowd, who is a former seminarian and an award-winning uh, UK documentary filmmaker who's made films, uh, award-winning films for Channel 4 in the UK, for the BBC. And he, he's, he's a very interesting guy. He did a, a, a documentary called Queer and Catholic for UK television. And in that, and I quote, he says... The priesthood is racked with guilt, lies, suppression, secrecy, and suffering, and that the church is seen by many as a gay profession. Oh. And, what, and what he goes on to say is, wow. if you think about it, if there's a young man, 22, 23, who, 24, who is, who is not married and sitting around the family table and the grandmother saying, well, Mark, dear, when are you going to get married? It, she, it, you don't have those awkward questions if he's training to be a priest. Exactly. So... What Mark's, and, and Mark is, is, is an openly That's gay man. Very interesting. Yes, yes. And, and he was an openly gay man who trained uh, 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 at a seminary and then left it because he discovered he was gay, and that essentially went against uh, what, uh, you know, the, the teachings that were being taught. So these things are issues. So he left on principle. He left on principle, and he knew that basically it would be unsustainable for him. Yeah. So, so, so these points, they are, they are interesting issues that the Except Catholic Church are not dealing with. But it is accommodated until, as you said earlier, one gets caught. caught. Basically, if you get caught, you're out. That's and it. actually, there are numerous instances in the United States where priests have gotten caught, and it's been very controversial. They haven't been kicked out because yeah. the higher their stature, the less likely they will be kicked out. What they'll be is moved. Yes. They'll be relocated. Yes. I mean, there have been instances where priests have been found to be, of course, abusing children. Yeah. 
girls and boys, of course. Yeah. And they have just been moved to another parish. Yeah. And this has been outrageous to so many Catholics, not to mention everyone, that that's the case because yeah. they've been slightly reprimanded, their, their wrists have been slapped, and off they go on to carry on in this yeah. similar manner in another place. Yes, and I think in any other profession, teaching, uh, me medicine, uh, science, people would be uh, put in prison, they would be ostracized from society, exactly. yet the Catholic Church is the slight little rep reprimand and go on and, 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 and really we, we are condoning what you are doing is the underlying message. That's exactly and so. And that is unacceptable in any society. Right. And as you will know over the last uh, week or so here in the US, I think uh, in California the Catholic Church is about to pay out something like a billion dollars in compensation. Oh. God. And if this continues, it, it, it does have the, the, the possibility of bankrupting the Catholic Church in the United States. And it's paying for its past sins. Now, I believe that you can't actually just you know, pay people off and let it go. I think fundamentally you have to look at the underlying problem. You have oh, to deal with yeah. it. Now, the other thing I would say, and it's important I say this, it's a coda to that really, which is this. I'm not saying that if you drop the vow of celibacy that it is a panacea for all ills within the Catholic Church and mm. that suddenly the Catholic Church will, will become great and good again because human nature being what it is, mm -hmm. that probably won't happen. But if the Catholic Church looks, if it shines a light into this dark area and looks at it, I believe it will have much more credibility in the world. Like it's had to look at, it, it's, at its past to do with uh, the Holocaust and its support for the Nazis. And it, it tried to sweep that under the carpet for many, many years and really has to face up because we as Catholics, we are expected to go and confess and look at, at, at our, our, our defects of character, if you like, and talk about that. So the Catholic Church is an institution. And correct it. And, and correct, correct it. it. Yes, yeah, and correct it. Say, this is what I've done. I'm very sorry for this. And, and, and I have the willingness um, to do something about it. And I believe the Catholic Church is an institution needs to do that because if it does that and it's seen to do that in an open honest and direct way then you know human nature being what it is we say okay they made a mistake let's now move on let's draw a line under it forgive They've, them yes forgive them yeah yeah <laughs> forgive them let us admit they, they know not what they, they do forgive them father they know not what they do yeah let us admit our mistakes and let's move on and whilst it is not doing that we will always have in the back of our minds that there is dark dirty murky water that is not being looked at. Very and, true. and hopefully, you know, something like Conspiracy of Silence, if it's seen by a wider audience, can at least open that debate. And we are getting a release in other parts of the US as well, which is good. I mean, it was initially in New York in order to elicit the reviews primarily. Yes. And then it's going to Where other else? places. It's going, well, we've, we've got, it's going to San Francisco, to Berkeley, California. It's going to Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Um, uh, Boca, is that how you Boca pronounce it? Boca Raton. Boca Raton, yeah. Excellent. Uh, San Diego, Orlando, Portland, Houston, Dallas, Austin, Tampa, Boston, Cleveland, and Los Angeles. I don't know the dates for Los Angeles yet, but certainly, um, y you know, it, it, it's planning to go there. But I want, Wonderful. I wanted to, I want. To, these will be primarily art house cinemas. I wanted to see it in the multiplexes. Oh, I yes. wanted to see it where Fahrenheit 9-11 was screened, oh, yes. where Passion of the Christ was screened, because this is a film that needs to be seen, people need to go and see it, need to debate it, and need to, to look at this whole issue. Means. Miramax, listen up. <laughs> this is an opportunity. <laughs> well, in fact... Don't uh, miss it. Yeah, Watch Entertainment, who are, are a New York-based distributor, uh, I have it on good authority from them that they are prepared to do a deal with a larger distribution Excellent. company, you know, should the deal work out, and and, and, and you know, I kind of feel it it's going to happen, John, because this is of such a quality, and the and and just from an artistic point of view, it's so magnificently done. I mean, you exercise such care in the scenery, in the shots, in the landscapes, in the moods, and the acting, and that I, that's another feature, if I may, may say about the film. Here I go again, um, which is to say that. Here are not particularly well-known actors who do a superb job. I mean, just superb. And I, I think that's meaningful, actually. Yeah, I like you. to see that go on. Yeah. I mean, I think it reflects some of your uh, 
your labor leaning <laughs> from way back, you know, and I, I like to see that. You know, yeah. I think it's very healthy. I want to ask you, because um, the clock is ticking again, believe it or not, <laughs> and uh, it's unreasonable. Um, how far up does all of this go in the Catholic Church? I know you've done a lot of research. You've spoken with lots of priests in the Vatican and elsewhere. Um, how far does it go? I believe, from my research and the people I've met, that it goes right to the top. I mean, obviously, I do not have direct evidence of this myself because I didn't speak to the person involved, but I was told... Um, He's a bit old. Uh, here, well, I mean, I want to say right <laughs> to the top. I'm not talking about yeah, I'm right. not talking about His Holiness the Pope okay. himself. I'm talking about, you know, right-hand men, uh, very senior yeah. uh, uh, people in the Catholic Church. And that's how far it goes. I mean, I was told by one priest that there is a, uh, somebody who's very, very close to the Pope who uh, is gay and is also HIV positive. Now, I have no direct evidence for that myself, but that's what I was told. So it goes right to the top. And there, and there is and a dilemma And you have there. spoken with people who are very high, or high up Absolutely. in the Vatican? Absolutely. I've spoken to priests on the ground, and I've spoken to people who've come forward to me anonymously, introduced through, through these priests, who've come and told me their stories on first name terms. And, uh, and so I certainly have it on, on what I believe to, to be good authority. The people I spoke with, I could feel that they were speaking the truth to me. And I couldn't put any of this in the movie for obvious reasons, it just would never be financed. I, I went as far as I could. And the crucial thing to say, and probably the final thing to say, is that it, 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 it is not based on real events, it is inspired by real events. And I, I'm allowed to say that, the lawyers have said I can say that, because there's a, there's a difference between based on real events and inspired by real events. Oh, an important distinction. And it's an important distinction, so, you know. So. May I ask then, uh, was there a particular priest who did take his life under those circumstances, or is this a confluence of... No, there was a particular priest who took his life under those circumstances, under those tragic circumstances, because he was HIV and he couldn't deal with the rejection that he got from the Catholic Church. And he did have a relationship with someone fairly high up? Absolutely, 100%, absolutely. And there was a young man aspiring to the priesthood who was um, dismissed because of, uh, in a sense, almost being set up in a way. Yes, that's absolutely happened. And the other crucial thing that happened was there was a man who stood up in the Vatican with a placard saying the church has AIDS. It was his personal oh, protest. Wonderful. And, and that's very powerful. And this did get televised in on Irish television? No, it such? didn't. It was completely suppressed. Nobody outside of the people who were there at that special general council meeting heard about it apart from one or two select journalists. Was there a journalist whose family was threatened? Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about that, yes. Did you uncover a relationship between, uh, this is a hard one, but you know, this is what everybody needs to know, and there are things written about it, the relationship between the Vatican and the Mafia? No, I didn't. I deliberately didn't go down that route. I mean, Coppola dealt with that to an extent in Godfather 3. There have been other films about sure. it. But no, I didn't go down that route. So I can't say... My, my, my instinct and my feeling is, from everything I've read and from other books I've read and people I've spoken to, that there is a link. But I, didn't, I, I deliberately did not go down that route. I was talking... I was going to tell a story about the celibacy issue in the Catholic Church and how it is destroying the church from the inside. You are providing a great service in the name of truth. And uh, even if it was inspired by, the truth is there. And Absolutely. It's really well articulated, John, so I just thank you. Well, thank you once again, Mitchell. Absolutely. Thank you. Great to have you. We'll thank have you. you back when you complete your next film. <laughs> <laughs> if not before to continue this conversation. <laughs> this is Mitchell J. Raven for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you all next week. Make a point of seeing this film. <laughs>